Metamorphics Podcast. I am your host, Temenosis, and today I am joined by Jonathan McCormick, an attachment specialist trained in the ideal parent figure protocol and internal family systems. You can find him over at attachmenthealinghelp.com, and you can also find that link in the bio. Jonathan, hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you, brother. Oh, it's good to hear. It's good to be here. You know? Yeah. Thank you. So I'm excited to talk to you today. Attachment is something I have always been very drawn to, especially training as a psychotherapist. Um, I think it's largely talked about in pop psychology, but I think not always fully understood. And so I think this could be a really fun conversation to deep dive in to really understand attachment from, you know, all sorts of lenses. Yeah. So I want to just kind of talk to you a little bit and know who you are and what got you into this work. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, first of all, attachment's huge. And, you know, you could tell it's like a huge booming industry. You know, it's kind of like the word narcissism. All of a sudden, <laughs> everyone's a narcissist. You know, yeah. all of a sudden, everyone's got attachment problems. They're not too clear what that means, but they got them. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I actually got into this. Yeah, you know, I started doing drug and alcohol counseling. Worked uh, with uh, behavioral disorder children. A lot of really inpatient, rough places. Very mm. depressing. And I actually got into this because I went into therapy. I needed help. And, and I almost feel like that wounded healer archetype, like mm. those are my people, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I'd rather have someone, because I don't know how your training was, but I remember, uh, you know, my supervisors would say, you really don't have to have the same experience. After all, a heart surgeon doesn't need to mm. have a heart attack themselves. Right. That's true. But this is talking. And when you're talking, you want to know someone at least knows where you've been. Knows the ballpark at the very least. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, you you yourself don't have to go through terrible trauma, but you've lived a life where you you at least know that neighborhood. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And with attachment, it's very different than, say, uh, many psychodynamic theories because uh, psychodynamics... Sometimes it can be a little more blank faced, you know, kind of near mm-hmm. you, so on mm-hmm. and so forth. Well, someone has attachment problems, it's very relational. And attachment therapists ought to be very relational, you know, very upfront. I mean, you know, if I mm-hmm. care about someone, I would actually say it like, hey, hey, I care about you. And, you know, a lot of psychodynamics are like, no, that's crossing some borders, you know. So I was in that kind of psychodynamic there. It, not psychodynamic, I, I wish. I, oh. I wish. that would. But, but just regular talk therapy. I was in it for years. And I was always afraid to say how, um, how uh, you know, this is going to actually get me better. Always terrified, you know. And one day I finally said, listen, I'm not getting any better. I've been here for a couple of years. And she actually goes, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> You know what your problems are. Mm. I was like, yeah, I do know. I've been knowing it for a long time, but it hasn't been changing. That's the problem. So I started looking into experiential modalities, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, Things where a session is an experience. Experiences Mm -hmm. change us, you know? They're more somatic. They're more Mm -hmm. emotion-based, bottom-up stuff. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy is all like kind of top-down and bottom up stuff. And I started looking at my own relationship problems. Yeah, you know, and, and and you know, even though I read so much object relations, this, that, the other thing, I, I even though attachments in the pop world, I don't know the pop world. Like I I'm so clueless. Mm-hmm. But in the literature that I was reading, it really wasn't mentioned that much. Uh, now I know it's mm-hmm. a big thing. Mm-hmm. But it really wasn't, you know, when I got involved. Like they weren't tat you know, it's mentioned very peripherally. Yeah. And, and so I got myself uh, an attachment therapist for me, you know, mm. and it helped me so much. And I thought like, yeah, this is it. You know, I, I, I uh, the thing I do is ideal parent figure protocol. We talk about that later, but it's just a modality that really helped me. Oh. And the other thing about attachment theory is like when I saw it, 
it really clicked, you know, because when you read psychodynamic theory, they're not, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying they're very complicated and it's hard unless you're a very intelligent, abstract thinker. Well, I am kind of like that, but a lot of people aren't. But unless you are like that, it's hard for you to place yourself in it. And you don't need to, if you have a good therapist, you don't need to, but me, I want to understand. And the attachment theory was so simple. It comes from a guy named Bowlby and it was like very easy. And it, it, it explained so much. And I started looking at personality disorders mm. in an attachment way, mm. people's anxiety disorders in an attachment, way. OCD even in an attachment. And attachment doesn't solve all these things uh, at all, but it makes sense of them in a mm. way that mm -hmm. kind of was very, I started seeing people's other people's problems. Like, you know, it's something to do with security and depth and we kind of know that. I mean, listen, Freud said, what is the cure? The cure is love. Mm -hmm. So we kind of know that already. That is something about attachment. But this kind of brought it to it. And when I started looking at the world, I'm always like, so why, why come everyone's unhappy and sad? A million reasons. But just one, I really do believe, is we're relational beings. We are made to be dependent upon each other. I think, yeah, people dig philosophy. McKintree says we are dependent rational animals. Yeah. And yet all I hear is about independence and our society mm -hmm. has been making our society has been making us more disconnected. I believe Wendell Berry says this should be our metric. If we should adopt a technology, does it make us less dependent on others? And if it does, we ought not adopt it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. I get it. But, but I appreciate the sentiment. You know what I mean? And when I saw that, I was like, I'm very disconnected and my friends are. And everyone I'm seeing, and yet they're in therapy. They have good jobs. They got a house. Why can't they have long-term relationships? I, I just don't understand why there's so much, so much depression. I mean, you know, I get it. But that much? And why can people, uh, listen, I mean, let's just be honest. 50 years ago, I'm not saying relationships were great. I'm not saying like people were happy, but it was easier. And there's a lot of social reasons for that, you know, a lot of, okay, I get that, but it seems like, okay, even with that, well, why can't we do that? I, I didn't get it. Attachment mm. kind of opened that up for me and it helped my own healing. I just kind of wanted to give back to other people, you know, that was my little journey. Hmm. Yeah. yeah like, thank you for sharing that story. I'm struck by a lot of what you said. I think starting out too, it sounds like in chemical dependency and more of the like you say, higher acuity, mental health care world. Yeah. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and how poorly staffed and trained those areas are mm. in in mental health care and how desperately it needs a different model, a different way of looking at the human. And then also really appreciating what you said about the sort of psychoanalytic, almost like mirror. You know, we're just supposed yeah. to be these neutral mirrors that don't really have a mind of our own exactly um, or if we do it's kind of hidden we don't we don't share it with the client certain that would be a really bad move yeah and so we're, we're just kind of this neutral mirror that's taking in the unconscious and maybe every other session we we give an interpretation mm -hmm. and it likely doesn't fully land but it increases insight so you're going to get better if you increase an insight or self-understanding. Right. Not if you change, but like right, the, right. the idea of changing. So I, I really appreciate you sharing your journey of, of going from yeah. that, like getting that almost neutral, kind of cold and distant yeah. psychotherapy to yeah. a more relational attachment based informed yeah. by how we are formed by relationships. It's true. Yeah. Well, how is, I mean, you're psychodynamic. Is it still like that? Or do I have like an old school Freudian view? Is it still very mere, uh, yeah, impersonal? Good, good question. Yeah. I, so personally, I think it's changing. I think, okay. I think psychotherapy in mass is moving towards somatic attachment yeah. based trauma informed perspectives. Yeah. Um, really in the relationship. That's what I see as being the, the, the leading edge right now of therapy mm. 
there are though in a lot of psychoanalytic corners yeah yeah a, a more neutral stance and less i would say it's coming from a very highly educated place you know reading a lot of books mm. on psychoanalysis the history of psychoanalysis freud object relations you know contemporary schools and and so some some of there's like a little bit of pretentiousness i noticed like oh i wouldn't i wouldn't just go it wouldn't be that simple you know mm. it needs to be more complex so i think yeah. there's some pretentiousness in the psychoanalytic crowd but I get where they're coming from. But at the same time, I, I think it misses sometimes the simplicity of of what people need in, in certain, like, don't give them reassurance ever. Like, I, never give any kind of I, reassurance or corrective emotional experience because that doesn't exist. You know, there's something like that never happened. They never got the corrective emotional experience. So don't give it to them. Yeah. But there's something about that that's like, oh, cruel. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're humans. I, I get it. But yeah, I suppose I suppose I saw actually less about psychodynamic and more about psychoanalytic. You know, I used to hang out with a bunch of Lacanians and mm. holy like brother, that was like the worst days of my life. Because they'd be telling me like, yeah, I have a person, he's suicidal, and then they would talk for like three hours of this almost incomprehensible and I love abstract thoughts, so I'd be so into it. But it was like a game, it's almost like a secret language. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, is this kind of a weak, this is a, like, what, what is this? <laughs> this kid needs X, Y, and Z. And you're talking about the mirror stage and uh, petite object A and da, da, da. <laughs> and, and as you know, you know, Freud was like, wanted everyone to have psychic hygiene. And they noticed the working class were immune to psychoanalysis. And, and mm -hmm. if you heard that, I'm Irish. Yeah, you yeah, heard yeah. like, oh, Freud uh -huh. supposedly, I don't think he said this, but supposedly said Irish people are immune to psychoanalysis too. Uh -huh. I don't know if he actually said that. I've heard that thrown around. But it's like, well, listen, if you have a modality that is only good for like 10% of uh -huh. people, that's not a good modality. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But but what does that tell you if it doesn't work for working class people? You know? Yeah. I mean, really, it's yeah. like bring it down. And, and I, I agree that's all about I'm big into somatic, you know. And it's like, oh, look, we have bodies. Oh, Shocking. Yeah, yeah. People didn't know that before, I guess. But uh, uh, we still think of ourselves as, you know, Descartian. I think, therefore I am. And I'm like, no, mm. no. I love, therefore I am. And I'm mm. not a brain on a stick. I'm shaped bodily. Bodily all the time. I mean, come on. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. It's kind of, and, and believe it or not, I, I talked to Donald Kalsha, the very, very famous Jungian guy. Mm -hmm. And even yeah. he was like, yeah, Jungians completely forgot about the body. And we're going to start bringing in somaticism. And that's pretty exciting. I'm not yeah. too much into Jungian, but I just dig to see how these modalities will deal with the body. It's so interesting. So interesting. I think, yeah, that we have, we have really ignored the body in therapy. And I don't exactly know why. Maybe, maybe it's this like really ancient uh, idea of like the the spirit being disembodied and so yeah you know maybe we shouldn't worry what how we feel on the body it should be independent of the body you know, what exactly are we working on then I, I mean, it's interesting I, so i certainly yeah. I certainly resonate with that well it's so funny somaticism they, they kind of have a little schema and they're kind of like well here's the deal you got a basic belief system or something that's all unconscious right but before you have a thought you you, you have an emotion and before you have an emotion, you have a sensation and you feel a sensation in the body and then you have an emotion and then you have the thought and the mind is based off of a schema. So there's a first uh, schematic thing and that's how they think of it. I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea, but, but oftentimes that's how they think of it to do these modalities. I have to say, I, I was in therapy. No one ever asked me like, where do you feel that in the body? When you're around this person, you know, are your hands clenching up? Mm -hmm. No one would even point out to me. They would just say, you know, what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like, I was like a, you know, like, like um, a disembodied mammal. You know, like, mm -hmm. well, I'm not Casper the ghost here. I'm in my, uh, <laughs> like, I, I, I am my meat suit. Like, I'm, um, mm -hmm. you know, let's not split body and mind apart, you know, because mm -hmm. we're all whole beings and, uh, 
you know, and, and that stuff's just beginning. And again, what's sad is a lot of somatic, blah, 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 very expensive and hard to find. And I really don't like, and, and another, I don't know how, you, how your thing was, but when I went to school, we learned very basic stuff and I had to learn everything paying for it. Yeah. You know, and I still do it. Like, you know, like I, I got, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I had to pay to learn ideal right. parent figure. I had to pay for some, I had to pay. Right. And as you know, it's thousands of dollars. Yeah. And guess what? Most therapists are not going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to learn these modalities. IFS, you know, man, you know, I took level one, you know, how expensive it was. It's, mm. you know, like brother, you're rich. You're rich as hell. If you can, or you're like me and you don't have a family and you're very comfortable mm. being living small, but that's a privilege. Most people are not privileged. And I mean, I just think that's awful that you, you don't learn these things in university. You know, you Agreed, do learn yeah. CBT, uh, da, 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 da. There's just a couple great. That, yeah, like, how was it for you though? Yeah, very similar in the sense that, and I think some programs are different, so I don't want to say that my <sighs> program represents it, but I, my sense is the only reason I felt comfortable jumping into doing my first therapy session is, is because of my clinical experience working in a, a psych hospital mm. and community mental health before going to grad school oh. and having learned there and done my own work. So that was probably the biggest thing is doing my mm. own work and working with others. And the, the training I got in school felt just kind of like a very basic review of yeah. CBT, uh, DBT, motivational interviewing. So uh, how yes. do you ask questions and how do you listen? Really basic people skills that I, I think, in in my in my personal opinion, like it would have, it, it would not have trained me to work with a person. No, oh, I, I work, agree. Do therapeutic work. Yeah. Deep, deep, real therapeutic work. I mean, I, I could go listen to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. And there's therapeutic value to that, but to actually do work where something is transformed in a way that positively benefits somebody's life, I don't think I could have done that work with the training uh, I got. I, I totally agree. Uh, and by the way, I don't, I don't mean to downplay psychodynamic therapy. Just so you know, my therapist I see now is psychodynamic, so I'm not... Mm. Uh, I'm not downplaying it. And some schools are great for psychodynamic. I know that too. But mm. Gabor Mate, yeah, he rails against America at least that, mm. you know, we're, we're churning out therapists that know nothing. And I have to agree. Uh, I, I didn't, I learned certain things, but not much. The yeah. supervision, very, uh, and, and you know, so what did I do? I pay, I pay people. But that's because right. I got the money. Most people don't got money. And most, most people aren't going to pay for it. Why would you pay 150 bucks a week? Da, da, da. Yeah, I can do it. Most people can't. They're scraping by, man. It, it's mm -hmm. just so awful. And then people, you know, tell me, oh, I was in therapy for years and didn't work. Of course, you, you, you know, you, you're, not, you're not being prepared, you know? And, and people mm -hmm. are suffering from it. Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah, there's something, there's something to you as a therapist, you can only do, in, in my opinion, the work if you in some way understand the, the map and the territory. Mm. At the very least, the territory. You, know, I don't, you don't always need to know some kind of conceptual map, but if you've been through it yourself, yeah, then you can do it. Because then, then your own fears when you come up against someone feeling horrible shame that they're going to be alone forever... Mm. And you and you don't understand what that actually feels like. Yeah. And that it's actually safe to feel that feeling. Yeah. Then you can't guide someone there. And you I, and a yeah, lot I mean, of people think, just don't yeah. and so they don't go there. Well, I mean, think of the response if someone goes, I feel terribly alone, and the person goes, Yeah, but you have a good job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, uh wow, I, what planet are you from? And I will say that I also think is, you know, so I learned I, I do some IFS. Well, what did I do? I got an IFS therapist myself for quite a while. I teach it, so I got that because I wanted to, no, well, frankly, I needed it. You know, that's mm. why I did it. But also just to see what it's like to be on the other side. Like you said, you had this experience, da-da-da. 
Mm-hmm. And, and, and that was so helpful. I'm always a little sketched out by therapists that don't have their own therapist or never went through therapy. Mm-hmm. I'm like, really? Boy, because life's yeah. very messed up now. How did you do that? You know, and, and some people don't need it. So God bless them. I, I know some that never have been and they're wonderful. But boy, a lot of them, I don't know. I think that's kind of a important thing that you, you're self-working. At least, at least you have mm-hmm. something you're doing. Yeah, I think it's what makes or breaks therapist in my experience is that the level to which you're willing to go to the scary darker mm. places within yourself yeah will determine how you can show up to others there and and so if you are the kind of therapist that doesn't do that you just hand out worksheets or <laughs> right. yeah you're kind of in the back like you're not really it may be Maybe you're just giving advice like, hey, uh, you know, yeah, you might feel alone right now. But if you if you put yourself out there, um, let me think of I'll find a worksheet for you that can improve your communication skills. Right. And you'll right. actually get you'll get what you want then. Yeah. And you're completely missing the, you know, this open wound that yes. is just bleeding out. Well, I, I tell you, Let's man, I was once. On that. Yeah. yeah it just, funny, I was like 19. Terrible, terrible very depressed. I went to see a DBT and she actually gave me a worksheet and she goes, this will, this will help you. And I looked at it Mm. and it was like 20 things to do to feel better. Uh And it was literally like, and this is literally, I'm not joking. It was go to a Hallmark card store and pick out funny cards. Uh, Mm. (laughs) Construction paper. And da, da 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 Now DBT is a lot better than that. So not, 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 but it was just like, here I am. I'm so, I'm so alone. I'm so, I'm going through, you know, when I was young, yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah, and yeah. someone handed me a worksheet and oh, I was like, it's, it's so dehumanizing. Isn't it? I, I know it's, it's unbelievable. It's uh, uh, and I, yeah. I, I've heard, I have friends who like, you know, like, Oh, what modality are you going through? And they're like, Oh, we're doing a schema therapy. She's never done it. We're going through the book together. And I'm mm-hmm. like, ah, that that doesn't sound like a good idea. Like she's learning it on the fly as you go. Yeah. Together? I don't, you know. It's, okay. It's so interesting. I, I saw that when I worked in the psych hospital was people were at their lowest in their entire life. You know, this is yeah. the the most difficult place they've ever been. And gnarly, gnarly places and yeah. emotional experiences that most of the population I don't think can fathom. Mm. And certainly not the you know these were usually occupational therapists giving coloring sheets, you know, so they can color in. And I, you know, for some people that's grounding, but again, it's, it's so dehumanizing and it so misses. Yeah. Like there's something about it. That's so tone deaf. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I could talk about this for hours, but I do want to pick your brain a little bit. Sure, on sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm just going to ask this really broad question. What sure. is what is attachment? Yeah. Well, attachment is essentially the ability to bond, right? It's just the ability to bond. You, you, if you're when you're born, you're a little baby. You have to have the ability to feel safe around that parent and to want to be around them. And w- what does that actually look like? Okay, it's about five things. If you grow up in a uh, family, the first two years, a lot of attachment patterns are uh, put down. No, not like Bowlby thought in, in a very deterministic way. We, we now know they can change. But I have to say they're pretty, uh, uh, put it this way, probably around 80% of people die with the same attachment patterns they had when they were born. Mm. They don't change a whole lot unless you do it intentionally. You know, mm. Th- things can happen, you know. Uh, but, but they're pretty set down. But th- so I- I- if you grow up, you naturally have a, a sense of safety. Why? Uh, your parent was very reliable and consistent. Oh, and you get this thing like, no, this mom and dad, reliable, consistent. That's what makes us feel safe, even in a relationship. These five things are, by the way, what makes a good relationship. Uh, uh, being attuned. What does that mean? Well, you know, 
the parakeet knows what you're going through and they kind of feel into you and they know when you're hungry and they kind of tell when you're, you know, and you feel someone else is there. Three, they can soothe you. They can soothe you. Yeah, you know, by the way, if you're going to a relationship, first thing, you know, I don't care anything else, are, do you feel soothed? Do you feel regulated when you're around them? You know, that feeling you got with grandpa, your mom or your dad, do you get that? Mm -hmm. Well, you're regulating them and they're regulating you. And if you can't do that, that rarely changes, uh, you know. Uh, the other thing is delight. You know, mm -hmm. well, you run parents who delighted in you. I got to tell you, a lot of us are great in delighting in our partners, but we have trouble being delighted in, you know. I mean, when's the last time you just gave yourself open and just, oh, I'm just going to let myself be delighted in. But that's what the child should experience. And fifth is support. And support's about exploration, you know. Perhaps you've seen little children on the playground and they go out and play. Then what happens? They get dysregulated. What do they do? They come back to mom. And they just touch her. They just touch her. Regulation. And then they go out and explore the world. Same thing with our partners. Of course, we don't want codependency. We want each person to be dependent and independent. But when we come home from work and we're dysregulated, that person, oh, yeah, they regulate us and we just feel safe around them. And what does that look like? Well, basically, you're okay with being alone, but you're also okay with someone getting close to you. Those five things will be there, whether you're alone or whether someone gets close. Attachment prompts, someone gets close and you cannot be delighted in. Someone gets close and you are dysregulated. Someone gets close, you don't feel safe. So like whatever. And those are the five things that make a healthy attachment. You know, mm. that's all. And, and just briefly, there's, there's basically two, anxious attachment and avoidant attachment. Sometimes people have both. Anxious attachment, well, that means probably that parent may have been inconsistent. And I'll just say this, not because they're bad parents. That's not true. I've had clients with the most wonderful parents in the world, but they weren't around. They mm. had to work. They're wonderful, mm -hmm. but they weren't around. And, and the kid was, the kid doesn't know that. The kid doesn't know mom and dad's working for me. The kid just knows that I'm, I, mom's not there. And it's not the parents' fault. Wonderful parents. But if you're anxious, what happens if someone's not consistent? Well, you reach out. You're hyper vigilant. You're hyper attached. You reach out to claw and hold on to them. You are needy. Avoidant? Well, I bet you if you're avoidant, you try to reach out a million times. And no one was there for you. You cried, no one came. You're really hungry, no one came. You uh, wanted to tell your mom and dad something, they didn't care. They weren't around. So you just shut down all attachment systems completely. I don't even have a need for love. You know, these people are very avoidant. Mm -hmm. So people have both. If they have one parent one way, another parent the other way, then they have both depending. Some of us are very needy, sometimes they're very avoidant. And I got to tell you, I know it's a very simple little schematic there, but a lot of people kind of fit, fit in there, you know, and you can kind of see relational dynamics just by that, you know, just by that, that alone. And so we say, whatever happens the first 18 months makes an internal working model. It just means this is what I'm going to expect. This is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to be expected to do. This is what I think relationships look like. And I don't care if you learn new information later, it's in your body already. That's your pattern, you know, that's your pattern. And that's how you will navigate the world. And uh, I, I personally believe, uh, yeah, before World War II, for the Industrial Revolution, yeah. I mean, you grew up, you had several grandpas and uncles and then maybe dad's an alcoholic, but you got two uncles and two aunts and, you might suffer and be starving and have meant, uh, but attachment? No, there was no attachment issues. I mean, come on. Mm. You had a million people. You felt safe. Primal peoples, indigenous peoples. The first two years of life, that baby barely touched the ground. Always in skin contact with mom. There's some wisdom there. What does it look like today? Well, today you got two parents, not like 50, not, you know, okay. And, uh, they might, at least one's going to be gone most of the time. At least one, probably both. Maybe you're in daycare. Oh, Lord. I, I get it. You got to do what you got to do. 
But, you know, actually, I believe the our current Surgeon General even made a big deal about the, the damage done by daycare. And I hate saying this because it makes mothers feel guilty. But but it, it does do quite a bit of damage. If that child knows you're there and has you as a security, that's great, though. And, and, and don't freak out too much. But but I do have to say it does do damage, you know. I mean, mm. We're all doing our best. The whole world's messed up. You're not going to be ideal. Don't feel bad, moms. Really, that's not going to help in any way. And, and they have you, and that's wonderful. Mm. But still, we've created a society towards isolation. And everyone's wondering, why come Generation Z is so messed up and they're so fragile and they're just little snowflakes? Well, I kind of agree. I, I get that. And and I'm very, uh, yeah, toughen up. And I mm. think it's a lot performative. And I get that. That's yeah, that's true. I'll give you that. But also look at this. They live in a postmodern world where everything's topsy-turvy. Who knows what's going to happen in 20 years? And they don't have the things you took that you don't even know made mm -hmm. you a secure human being. You just took it for granted. You know, people older. These kids didn't have that. You know? Uh they didn't have a steady attachment. They didn't have that safety. And they're not going to feel safe in the world. So, and believe me, everyone would be the same way if they grew up like that. You know? So it's kind of like, boy, unprecedented. Unprecedented since the World War II, everything broke apart. That's when it began. And boy, I think the Gen Z is really the, the this is the, finally mm. we're seeing the results. As much mm. COVID. That hurt because people are very isolated. That didn't help. Uh, but society is isolating, period. You know? I don't know my neighbors. They don't know me. I wouldn't go to them for help. You know? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, well, of course you feel very insecure. Of course you have anxiety disorders. Come on. Who wouldn't? Yeah. I like what you're saying about the more systemic view, you know, of how attachment just as a sort of en masse, how it's actually affecting everybody yeah you know, the lack yeah. lack of connection lack of intimacy even just with our parents maybe they're yeah, yeah. so one thing I'm, I'm thinking about as you're talking so i want to talk about the ideal parent figure but i also am just thinking generally if someone's listening to this and they're thinking you know i wonder if i'm have some kind of attachment disorder mm -hmm. or if there's been some wounding in attachment um, but how would I know? Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, you could, there's, there's a big test, AAI, the adult attachment. That's a fortune, which again is a shame. There are tests online that you can find, you know, but I, I, I would just, um, I, I, you know, I, I would just ask like, can you feel completely safe in a relationship? Can you feel very comfortable? And can I say, I can share anything and I can make my request known, hey. And when they tell me, like, hey, you were late today, and the person says, yeah, I was really busy at work. When they tell you that, you believe them. You mm. trust them. You, you can trust that. And, and instead of like, oh, yeah, is this a lie? Da, 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 da. No, no, if you've been with someone, you know, you know, can you feel that way? Can you make your request or you're like, you know, when he does this, it upsets me. And when she says this, but I just don't want to say anything. Oh, you know, you know, I, I mean, is that so mm -hmm. extreme? It's, you know, can you communicate? I wouldn't feel safe that way. If I could speak freely around my partner, mm -hmm. I wouldn't feel safe and relaxed. I wouldn't feel like how I used to feel with my grandpa. Mm -hmm. That's the feeling. Can you get the feeling that you had with that loved one when you're with them? You know? The other thing is, uh, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, it's kind of curious when you guys do have fights. You know, when you make up, are you closer? And if you're closer, your attachment's okay. Not too bad, probably. Yeah, it's a good rule. Or do you sweep another tongue? Oh, we're just not going to talk about it. Or is it kind of still resentments? Uh, there's some, um, you're not mm. attaching to that person. There's a fear there, to be honest. You know, those are kind of like quick little, you know. Mm. Check, check those out. See how you're doing. You know, another thing is like this, like imagine you're in the room, you're all alone, or you car broke down. Quick, quick. First person you think to call out to. That's your attachment figure. And if it's not your partner, 
Well, you got to think about that. Who is that? Is that your shrink? Is that your mom? Is that, it should be your partner if you're in a relationship because that's mm -hmm. your main base of security. Who do you first think of to reach out to? Just boom, what pops into your mm -hmm. head? It's a good, good little thought experiment, mm. you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just thinking this person listening in and saying, looking back and he's like, well, I, I don't actually trust my partner or feel safe with them. You know, come to think of it, I don't trust or feel safe with anybody. Yeah. And realizing, oh, I guess I am. I, I, I'm a bit insecurely attached. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do I do about it? Can I do anything about it? Yeah. Well, well that's the thing. Uh, it, it's very, um, modalities had to be built for this, you know? And I can tell you a good one. It's not built for this, but I think it works. IFS. This is parts therapy called internal family uh, systems. And this is kind of like, you know, we're made of parts. These aren't individual personalities. No, no, multiple, but no, no, no. But just, you know, part of you feels this way. Part of you feels that way. And it's almost like wounded little children. And IFS, you talk to that child, you witness them, you give an emotional correction. That child felt afraid, that inner child. So you give them some love and maybe you unburden them. Maybe you do a little cognitive reframe. Why, why are you so upset at eight when mom yelled at you? Because mm. you thought you were bad? Let's bring an adult perspective. You were not bad. Mom had issues, was stressed out, whatever. IFS is great. I, I do that. But the main one, kind of like the gold standard right now, is ideal parent figure protocol, you know? And uh, that was made by Dan Brown and David Elliott. Dan Brown died last year. David Elliott's still going strong. He's uh, revamping a little bit. He has uh, uh, integral attachment theory, he's calling it. But the ideal parent figure protocol is basically this. It's like, listen, you know, uh, you have this eternal working model, right? It's going off your memories. You know, you can do, you, you could just imagine different memories. Imagine a really loving parent. Imagine a parent giving you that delight, giving you that, this, that, the other thing. Why does that work? Well, as you know, the unconscious doesn't distinguish between memory and fantasy. And it really doesn't before the age of 10, because mm. there's no hard border. You know, little kids, they're half fantasy land, half memory, you know, and you can practice this. Now you need a facilitator or a therapist to do it because healing only happens in relationship. Mm. That's the only way it happens. A lot of theories why, I don't know, some special, some special about two hearts opening to each other. And so, you know, the modality kind of looks like this, like, okay, you know, you, uh, you close your eyes. And it's kind of like a guided thing. Now notice the ideal parents are doing X, Y, and Z. Imagine yourself as a little kid, what's happening. And you say, oh, I'm feeling loved and feeling that, oh, where do you feel on the body? Got to be somatic. Oh, right in my heart. Ah, and this and that, and you really ground these experiences in bodily. And since you're working, you know, if you're working with me or a therapist, it's collaborative. Someone's there. So that means all your relational neurons are lit up because you know someone's in the room with you. You know someone's there and you're talking to them. You're really attuned because I have my eyes closed. You have your eyes closed. I don't know what you're going through. You are going to have to know what you're going through and then be able to express it to me. And I'm going to be able to follow it. And we have to attune to each other. And I'm going to have to be clued in to feel like, oh, that's happening, I got it. Oh, and what's that like? Oh, and then imagine mm -hmm. this. And, and if I go the wrong way, then you have to be able to tell me, no, 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 you're talking too much, you're this. And I have to be very comfortable say, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. All these things are happening with the ideal parent figure protocol. Very simple, but a million things are happening. And if you do that, you know, for, for long enough, your mind starts saying, what can I expect when someone is angry at me. And instead of going back to when you were seven and getting punished, your mind automatically goes back to all those other memories, those fantasies, if you wish, in your imagination. And it goes based on that. And he uses that. That's hmm. the very basic thing. You're making a new internal working model, you know? Yeah. yeah and doing it in relationship with another human being well that's the thing being avoidance hear this and they go i'm gonna go and listen to meditations on my own 
Mm -hmm. My personal view is I believe they are helpful. Some people say, no, maybe I'm wrong. I believe they're helpful, but they're about 10%. And you mm -hmm. can do it that way. And again, I think they are helpful. But unless you're attuning, collaborating, you know, the three pillar method, only one you know, from Dan Brown, it's called the three pillar method. Only one is the ideal parent for your protocol. You know, the other important piece, well, collaboration. You have to collaborate. That's what relationships are about. And what's the third one? Mentalization. Mentalization, briefly, it's not knowing what's happening inside you. It's actually thinking about your thinking, you know? Hmm. So I might say like, yeah, you know, how, how are you and your girlfriend? My, me and my girlfriend get to, to get to along great. And we were just the other day, we were having such a good time. You know, we started arguing, which we always do. But then later we did X, Y, and Z. Well, hold on. If you're mentalizing, you're monitoring your thoughts, you just said you were getting along great, and then you just told me you were fighting. Hmm. That's poor mentalization. Didn't you notice you just did that? Hmm. And the weird thing about attachment theories, believe it or not, you can tell someone's attachment by their sentence structure. Hmm. It's, it's crazy. But so I'll have someone, and they'll be talking very coherently, very cohesively, very intelligently. And I'll like, oh, what happened with your mom? And if you're an avoidant, they'll be like, oh, uh, she hit me. Mm. And, mm. and she hit me, what? If you're anxious, I'm like, well, if you want, well, mom, da, 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 da. and you'll tell me like an eight hour long story that like involves like 16 characters and I can't follow it. Mm. And mm. your mind just goes into a million pieces. Meanwhile, I just talked to you and you're so coherent and, and you're so, what happened? Well, what happened is you became dysregulated and you have not done, you have not made sense of that. When you were eight, you didn't know why that happened. So you weren't able to turn that into a narrative that made sense mm -hmm. to you. Big thing about trauma we learned. What's trauma when you get sexually abused or beat? No, no, that's not. Because a lot of people have that happen to them and they don't have any disorders. How does that happen? Those people had a lot of support and they're able to verbalize it and talk it over. Again and again and again, me with their mom, me with their dad, and they kept talking, kept talking, day after day, week after week, month after month, until they were able to make sense of it and to turn that into a story of how that affected them and what that means to them. So it's not what happens to you, as Gabor Mate says. It's how you react to what happens to you. So the mentalization has a lot to do with being a narrative. And, and you'll tell people, like, oh, why, why did your father do that to you? I don't know. Well, he must have thought about it. That's pretty weird behavior. Yeah, I never really thought about it. If you're avoided, if you're anxious, you'll just come up, I have no idea. You come up with a million stories. No. Mm. Three pillar model, mentalization, collaboration, ideal parent figure protocol. You need all three. Yeah. And so who is the facilitator? What role do they take? Are they... Are they more so just a collaborator on the outside, a friendly witness, um, yeah. or are, do they become the ideal parent at any moment? Well, the, the, the therapist ought to model an ideal parent. That means, you know, you see someone, I can tell you, I only work with people I love. I work with people and after three months, if I don't really like this person, um, I'm not going to be good. And I say, Hey, let's part ways. Uh, that's me. Other people are different. And I have that privilege. I have my own private practice, so I can do that. Mm. So you ought to model how an ideal parent would be, right? But the truth is, Dan Brown came up with this because he said most therapists are awful. They're not good security figures. They're just not. They're not trained to be. And they're just not. They have their own issues, you know? You know how it is. Sometimes someone's talking, oh, uh, like, boy, <laughs> I remember one time... I got robbed and my car got hijacked in the Bronx and I had a mm. patient right after. Gee, do you think oh. I was really present for that patient? No, I was like shaking up. I was this, I was that. I was not a good parent, a good secure figure for him. Mm -hmm. And therapists mostly won't be. And if you notice, the really great therapists are like that. They're just very lively and very this. And then they teach other people their modality and it doesn't work. Because what was really working was them. It was really them. And I've seen that a million times. So Dan Brown says, you know what? Let's have them 
them have an internal security figure. That's not the therapist. So you're really not the, the secure person. That person should not be relying on you, the therapist. You turn them back to the, to the ideal figure and that'll happen in the meditation. Oh, notice that. Oh, I'm noticing this. And I really don't know why that is because and what do you think? And I'll say, and the ideal parent notices you're having those thoughts and notice what he does. Notice what he says. Don't rely on me. You're relying on inner parents. Don't rely on me. So it's yeah, much more collaborative. It's yeah, much a, more, you know. Yeah, there's a way in which both of you are, are almost co-creating yes. this ideal parent in the room. There's like yes. a third to third person in a way. Right. Rather because, than being you. Yeah. Because you know people, they get to be, I mean, you know. They get so dependent on the therapist. I've done it where I'm just, oh, and, and, uh, and people get dependent. They end up years being with them and mm -hmm. da, da, da. And that you have to go in the world yourself. You can't really be, uh, you have to have something internal. And, and I think Dan Brown's right that we're, we're just, therapists are just people. Even the best of us are off. We forget. Well, what did you say? Oh, I forgot that. And if you're sensitive, and you have attachment problems, that's going to really bother you. Mm. If it's mostly on the ideal parent, that's who should be the attachment figure. So yes, the, the therapist mentioned, you know, he tries to be an ideal figure. He does, he does, but it's much more about, no, this is about you and what you want. And you find that resource inside of you. Yeah. You know, using the ideal parent as a kind of cipher for that inner strength, you know, cause it's just the imagination. Yeah. yeah, and I, I really like what you're saying about, it sounds like this is something Dan Brown may have said, is, is the the ways in which therapists, after they've done their own sort of inner work, and to some degree are just walking around with their own sort of security mm -hmm. in their, their own existence, their own, their own view and um, self-worth. Yeah. And just that presence alone mm. can be regulating for people and maybe even transformative for others. And then they create a system saying, well, this is kind of what I do, but it's mm -hmm. more about what they're being rather yeah. than what they're doing. The yeah. doing is kind of just an outpouring of their being. Yeah. And then people try to do that and it doesn't always work. It doesn't actually always do the, the exact thing. And so what I'm hearing Dan Brown doing is almost sidestepping that whole process and saying, well, we actually want to let the, the clients themselves be that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm hearing? Oh, absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, for instance, Mark Schwartz over at Harmony Palace, great guy. Check out his videos. He's friends with everyone. So he had a client and he was trying to do IFS and he just wasn't getting anywhere. So Richard Schwartz, the guy who invented this, comes in and Richard Schwartz sits down and boom, instantly mm. it works. Mm -hmm. And Mark Schwartz was like, what? how did that happen? And it's because Richard Schwartz's presence you know, he just had that. Yes. Now his modality also works, I have to say. So, mm -hmm. but, but it just shows you how important presence is. And we know we don't all always have that presence. We have things going on in our life. Even if you've done work, your relationship, you're getting divorced, you're having bills and that will alter your presence. Mm -hmm. And presence is so important. Like you said, just your presence will be healing, but also realize a lot of times a therapist can't bring that presence in, you know, because he's just yeah. we're, we're all human. Yeah. So to, to counteract that, that presence ought to be found inside. And we keep directing the client back to themselves. Just, just so. I, I have a interesting question here about the, the ideal parent. So we're, we're, it's almost like we're, we're co-creating this ideal parent, but it's almost in place of, of a parent that was insufficient or a parent that was not able to meet our needs and our vulnerabilities in a way that was nurturing, that was accurate, realistic, or maybe they met them too intrusively and they were mm. actually, I know there's something about it that was invasive or abusive. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what can happen around that in my experience is, is there can be a lot of idealization of the parent is either either all good 
or they're all bad. <laughs> and so that that's almost like that splitting can be a really protective move for a little kid who just can't, like you were saying, can't make sense. It's too confusing. Like It's too complicated. It's also too dangerous to mm-hmm. have mom be good sometimes and sometimes not good. Sometimes yeah. bad. Actually, sometimes yeah. hurts me. Oh, yeah. And so that kind of, we just need to split it. So we need to have, no, there is a mom who is all good and infallible. Um, and there is a mom who is all bad. And and also there's a me who's all good. And there's also a me who's all bad. And, and I'm wondering if in when you're exploring this and kind of doing this, it's almost like correction, imaginal correction of the uh, the parent. If you notice those reactions, if you notice reactions of like I like I have hatred, I I really don't like this. I don't want I don't oh. want you here with me. I want you oh, to go. Oh yeah, I, absolutely. And you know what you're talking about happens, and particularly with avoidant attachment, they always idealize. So I'll say like, give me an example of a mother, a loving thing your mother did. Uh, she used to feed me. She was very loving, through it mm. every day. Ah, uh, mm. uh, really? That's ever hug you? No, no. But the food, very loving. Mm. Really? Mm-hmm. And what your dad said, hit you with a belt? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, he was tired and cranky. Don't blame him. Yeah. You know? It's <laughs> idealing. It's like, well, it's not a good father figure. I, I don't know what to tell you. And so you see that all the time in avoidant. And it, indeed, a lot of times you go into the parent figure and, and, and all of a sudden, and they're embarrassed to say it. I'm like, oh, you're with the ideal mother or father. What are you feeling? And they'll say, well, I feel like I'd like to kill him. You know, and, and I feel like, why the hell are they looking at me? And I feel like, da, 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 da. yes. And a lot of times with, with abuse, the ideal parents will automatically attack the child. That happens a lot with my more trauma. I mean, that's, I'm, I know that's going to happen, you know. Uh, so this, uh, so, you know, in the first case, you know, like, like your hate. Well, I know what an ideal parent would react to. They probably don't. You know, because they don't know. So what would I say? You know, I, I have to know what an ideal parent is. What, what, what an ideal parent, if a six-year-old came up and said, I hate you, I want you to die. Well, mm-hmm. an ideal parent would say something like, that's okay. You can feel however you want. I still love it. There's space here, and you can tell me you hate me, and I love even that part of you. Even the part mm-hmm. of you. And guess what? You don't have to love me. You don't have, and I don't expect you to. You know, if it was the ideal parent, you'd say something like, you're just getting to know me. Of course you're not going to love me. You don't know if you can trust me. And I would never ask you to trust me because you're smart enough. To, you'll see. You'll see how I act and you'll make up your own mind. Don't go by me. So I have to model that. Now them, they would have no idea. And, and by the way, when we say that, kind of like, you know, all of a sudden they're like, what? That's not supposed to happen. You know, they're confused. You're supposed to reject me. And I'm like, no, no. Do you want the ideal parent to go away? He'll just go away if you want to be alone. Whatever you want, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, you absolutely, you know, um, and, and if an ideal, ideal parent attacks, you might say, that's not the real ideal parent, obviously. So fade away. And a lot of times they need other imaginary uh, devices. Put yourself in a bubble, magic bubble, you know, and nothing can attack you. You got to do things like that, you know? I see. Uh, yeah. But like, like this, the most interesting thing Dan Brown ever said was attachment problems are a failure of the imagination. Hmm. I thought that was so, I'm still unpacking that, I have to admit. But I have seen that, that a lot of us, even with that attached prompts, can't even imagine what a loving relationship would be, a truly loving, like we can't even imagine it. What would that even look like? If I was, what would it look like if I just opened my heart and just told my girl, I'm so insecure, I'm, I'm secure, I'm gaining weight, I, I uh, worry about the money, mm. I worry about, what? Well, I can't even imagine. I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. imagine. And it is a, it's, it's, it is a lot to do with the imagination, you know? And that truly is, like, uh, you know, so, you know, the, the therapist yeah. is lending their imagination, you, you know, to them at certain parts, kind of like that. Yeah, I can't even imagine that connection is possible, mm-hmm. that vulnerability yeah. and connection is possible. Yeah, and I can't say if anyone's hearing this and tried and doesn't work, I have to say, a lot of times I don't start with that. Okay, forget about ideal parent. Uh, how about your adult best self? No. How about a stuffed animal? Have a big mm-hmm. teddy bear, a cartoon character, Star Wars, a dolphin. 
Uh, I've had clients imagine the Steve Puff Marshmallow Man as their ideal father. Okay, that's a uh, okay. Well, he's big. I guess I would feel safe. And yeah, yeah. Feet, I see the I benefit. I, I see the benefit in the imagination. It's kind of this. It's almost this as if world. Yeah. But yeah. what's different about it than just doing it in some meditation alone is that there's somebody there with you. <clears throat> that's sort of co-reifying this as yes. if. Yes. And being able to do it in a way that is responsive to your needs and to your vulnerabilities that you never got. Yes, yes, exactly. You know, and then you start expecting these things because a lot. Of, I tell you what, you know, I, I used to do date coaching uh, for for people with attachment problems because there's specific ways you can date intentionally. And I saw this. You know, people would be secure. I'll just say this, no one wants to talk about it, but you got to be secure inside. But guess what? If you have no job, no girl, no friends, I don't know, you're going to be very insecure. So there has to be social things. Number three, you have to know how to talk to people. I didn't know. I, I was one of those guys who had to read books. Like how mm. do I make a request? How do I put down a boundary? I didn't know. I don't care how secure you are, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and so, I used to, so I used to kind of coach some people on that. And they would ask me, like, well, can I expect them? Can I expect them to text me if they're gonna be like? Can I expect them? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, yeah, of course you can, but in their mind, no. If they ask, it's gonna be too much, too needy. It's all about our expectations. Like, well, can you? Can, what would happen if they did? You know, imagine that they did respond to you in the perfect way, and a lot of times they can't even do that. And they're like, I don't even know. Something so small, you know. I mean, the emotional oh. deprivation we live with as human beings, I think, is. You know, the loneliness today, the loneliness today is just emotionally and spiritually eviscerating. I mean, it's so sad. Oh, oh. I think yeah. I want to actually circle back a little bit to what you were just saying there about, you know, a, a, with attachment wounding, a lot of the wounding is around what can I expect? Mm. What can I expect from others, from the world, yeah. from myself? Mm. And I wonder, you kind of talked to that but i wonder if you could even talk to to somebody who's hearing this and think like well i actually don't know what i can expect yeah well I need the, other people yeah. to tell me yeah well this is something freud noticed he knows something about successful people they all had a super loving relationship with their mom and it was almost like they walked into the world expecting the world to be like their mom and the world was just going to open up and create a space for them and they just assumed that would happen and most of the time it did because they just assumed it and then he knows people who are very unsuccessful even though they're so smart and they had all these technical skills and he checking it and they had have a terrible relationship it could be with the other parent but the mother's oftentimes primal especially in that vienna society and they walked into a room expecting rejection automatically expecting expecting her you know, and uh, I used to, when I was very young, play poker for a living, right? I only did it for two years, but it was a fun thing. So what I do, I'd watch how someone walks into the room. And I'm telling you, there's a guy who walks in the room expecting everyone's going to like me here. And there's another type of guy who walks into the room expecting someone might hurt me. And you can tell in their very body language. I, I professional poker player, I hired an FBI guy to teach me body language. I mean, I was, you know. Mm -hmm. That's even in our bones. That's mm -hmm. in our body. Can you believe how deep that is? Mm. So that's the thing. So, you know, this manages your expectations because they don't know what they're worth. Why wouldn't you know if you can ask that? Why? Because you don't know if you're worthy of love, you know? Mm -hmm. And here's the big secret. Uh, no one else will ever make you secure, period. They can help you, but security has to come within you know mm -hmm. they can help you you can be on that journey but but the security does have to start with you you think this is going to make you secure you expect that ideally when you're acting out of any compulsion to be made worthy to feel worthy uh to make them like you that's not love love is freely given. again we're humans Let, let's we're humans we're all gonna come on we're here i get it but ideally, love is always free, never compelled, never compelled by anxiety, inner emptiness, inner uh, self-hatred. That's real love. And that means I don't need this person. 
I would like them. It's very, very valuable to me. But of course, I don't need them. Relationships are valuable. I don't need them. That's what mm -hmm. you want to be able to say. Because the security is actually already in me. You know? And I would say the security you feel with the other person is actually you getting in contact with what's ever inside you. That you're not actually, they're not making you feel secure. You're actually experiencing your own inner security. And, and you're mistaking the circumstances for it. Mm. Eh, that's a, I don't know if I'm right about that, but I like to think of it that way. It's, yeah, beautiful what you're saying. And just thinking of a hypothetical, you know, an as-if person right now listening to the podcast and thinking, well, you know, I, I don't find security in myself. I need, to, I need other people to tell me in some way or some shape or form that I'm okay mm. for me to really be okay. And, you know, I try to, I try to just like, maybe I'm trying to pull off in a pragmatic approach. Um, thinking of like William James of like, you know, as, assume something, assume it will be good and yeah. see what happens. Just like live a life as if things will, um, things will work out and then see what happens. You know, and let's say I'm trying that and I, I'm, but I'm always flooded by these horrible fears and doubts that yeah. I'm, I'm going to like lead myself on to just be even more disappointed than before. So it's actually better to stay hidden. Yeah. To stay and not expecting anything. If I expect something, then I'm just going to be setting myself up for disaster and failure and ruin. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. And, and I have clients who start to feel good and immediately comes the dread. Shut that down. You do not want to feel good because it's going to crush you when inevitably it fall, fails because it's going to. And da, 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 da. And, you know, I, I know that that thought process where you want to think, uh, but it's very somatic. Like, yeah, yeah, rationally, I could say X, Y, and Z, but, uh, you know, probably as you know, the story you tell yourself will follow the state of your nervous mm -hmm. system. Story follows state. So you can know X, Y, and Z, but it won't feel true. It will only feel true if the body feels secure. You can know mm -hmm. this person loves you, and I'm certain, and I'm convinced. Okay, does that feel true? No, I have anxiety in my body. Okay, that's why it has to be bottom up, you know? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, your body has to expect good things. Your body has to naturally, and you'll see people very relaxed, very secure, you know? And, and the opposite, the guys who are pretending, but you see them very tensed up. Yeah. And they're straining. Oh, if I just think more positively, uh, mm -hmm. if I just expect good things, your body isn't expecting it. I don't care what your brain says. Believe me. I mean, as you know, the unconscious is like an elephant. And your little ego is like a bird on it trying to steer. Go in a positive way. Good luck. The elephant's going to go wherever the heck the elephant wants to go. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I like what you're saying there about, you know, if you're trying to to hack it, you know, yeah. if you're trying to strategize yeah. top down, I'm, I'm going to be secure. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can almost You can almost be sure that you're insecure at that moment yeah exactly and a lot not of, being felt yeah yeah and i've done a lot of um uh, youth work and, and men's movement stuff back in the day not too much now but there was kind of a lot of that fake it to, and, and there's truth to that I'll, I'll give it you know act your way into new way of thinking I, I believe it i do believe it but there's a kind of like this is how uh a secure person acts and then you just try to imitate that this is how an attractive man, this is how a uh, mentally healthy uh, blah, blah, blah. And then you just try to pretend to be that person. Well, you're going to be a nervous wreck because you know the mask is going to slip. I mean, you know that, you know. And what, what do women like? What do men like? When they can see into the head of their partners and they know what they're thinking. That makes them very secure. That creates a secure relationship, you know. Uh, the guy who says, oh, uh, honey, every single meal is fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that girl will not trust you because that's not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to say like, no, this is awful. You want to say something like, no, no, this is good. But I know what I love. I love your egg man. The man mm -hmm. who is with the girl and the girl, everything's always wonderful. Everything he does is perfect. He knows that can't be true. What's in her head? What's in her head? But she's scared. She's scared to reveal it. And he's scared to, mm. you know, mm. so, so it, it's, you know, the perfect relationship, imagine like both people, you get to see inside their heads and you know what the guy's thinking because he's very honest and you know what she's thinking. 
Can you see what you're thinking? And the body feels secure. Oh, that's a great relationship. So, yeah. So I'm listening to this right now. I'm not not me. Again, another as if person's listening, and they're they're saying, okay, what what's one thing I can do right now? I I, I can't get a therapist right now. Yeah. Um. I. What's the one thing I can do to start showing up to my life more honestly, more directly, more yeah. in my body, like yeah. right now? Yeah. Because I'm I, lost. I, I, yeah. I, I truly believe this, and and it. Yeah. I, I'll tell you that. I think for the most part, the simplest things work the best. But um, uh, but don't believe me. Try yourself. If you did a ten minute body scan every morning, you, six months from now you be transformed because a lot of the things I'm talking about have reasons, but they're because of disembodiment. You're in your head and you're not in your body. You're thinking, was it like this? Or like, well, you know, we you know the answer. Your body knows it. Why are you in your head? Of course you're anxious. If you just did, and what does that look like? Very simple. Meditate, posture, sit in a chair, whatever, feet on the floor, straight back. Hey, look at my uh, forehead. What's it feeling? If it's tense, fine. You just know, oh, it's tense. Then my nose, then my chin, jaw, neck, chest, all the way down to my feet. If you spend 10 minutes a day, your relationship will get better because you will know what you're feeling. And if you're in your body, your body knows what you want. Your body knows what you're feeling. Your body knows what you need. And you just act from the body, out of your head, into the body. And it's wonderful for a lot of things, but for attachment especially. 10 minute body scan. Yeah works wonders hmm yeah it makes me think of the elephant and little bird metaphor you used for the the unconscious and the conscious and there's there's a way in which if the elephant is angry and 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 trying to kind of buck around and and flail but the bird's like no we we're we're okay right now i'm not mad <laughs> right you know that that kind of incongruent incongruence there and you know, yeah. the body scans able to just feel into this whoa there's a yeah. raging elephant yeah. And as you know, incongruence is a split, you know, like it, you split yourself. Part of you is a knower. I know that I'm upset. And then part of you is the doer, but I'm acting like I'm not. Oh, so now you got mm -hmm. a knower part of you. You got a doer part of you. You, you mm -hmm. just split yourself. You just, you're less whole. The minute you mm -hmm. lie, you know, if you know you're lying, you just split yourself and you're pretending. A and why can't you be present in that relationship now? Uh, because when you're split, the presence is full of anxiety and you don't want to be there. That's why you're in your head and not your body. You're only in your body when you're a whole. Because it's comfortable there. And now you can be present. And where's relationships? Right now, in the body, in the mm. present. You can only be mm. present if you're whole. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Jonathan, this has been a really fun conversation. Yeah, brother. Wondering... Enjoy it. Yeah, I'm wondering if if you could shed just maybe before we kind of wrap up, just like what does the journey of attachment healing or maybe going from insecure to secure? What what does that look like generally? If we could kind of map out the territory that someone might be going on if they decided to take this yeah, adventure. Well, yeah, I mean, what it is is it's almost like you know your relationship to the world. It's going to be like your relationship to other people. It's going to be like your relationship to yourself. It's basically learning to treat yourself well. I, I don't want to say you have to love yourself. It's about being curious about yourself in a loving way. Something like that. Something like that. And as you do it, you'll get more and more curious. Why? Because you can open up and share things and it's going to feel safe to do so. Just a little bit at a time. So you're going to learn so much more about yourself. And, and, and you're relationships would be easy. Why? Because you'll be curious about them. If you're insecure, you don't want to know too much because maybe they feel this way about you. Maybe they're going to be saying, you're going to be curious. And I tell you, you'll bring that right into the world. All of a sudden the world will look very curious and interesting and the world will open up because the world kind of reflects your inner self, uh, your attitude. Mm -hmm. And that journey it will be that kind of opening up of interest, mm -hmm. curiosity, and passion. You, we might even discover new talents, new passions, new creativities. That's the way it goes, believe it or not, just from doing attachment work. Mm. Yeah. 
Beautiful. So before we end, is there any, so I, I kind of said before when we started where people can find you, but is there yeah. any other thing that you've got going on right now uh, that you want to direct people to? Yeah, well, attachmenthealinghelp.com, but I also have a YouTube channel. I, I don't, it's probably called Attachment Healing, but if you look at me up, Jonathan McCormack, M-C-C-O-R-M-A-C-K, and I do uh, all this stuff. I just sit there and I talk about uh, all, all this stuff from spirituality to relationships, a lot of attachment stuff. And I always give a meditation at the end of everything. So I always give a 10 minute meditation, uh, which would be really useful. You can go to those YouTube videos and just check out the last 10 minutes for the meditation. And uh, mm. yeah, so that's pretty much it. And if people want, they, they, they can also work with you doing this work that we just talked about. Oh yeah, if right? anyone wants IPF or attachment, hit me up. And if I'm, I'm uh, right now, it, it, probably you know everyone's on vacation so i have openings right now <laughs> but oftentimes i do have a wait list but but I, I know a lot of people too so uh you know if you let me know if not me yeah i can put you on my wait list or i can find someone you know because it's hard to find good attachment people but uh I, I love helping people so please hit me up yeah hmm. well jonathan this has been really enjoyable for me and just like a pleasure to to talk with you on such a broad spectrum of of topics, all yeah. of which I feel have threads we could be pulling on for many, many conversations. If if that was something you're interested in, I certainly welcome sure. you back on this. Oh, I, I'd love anytime. it too. Anytime, brother. Yeah. <laughs>